Yeah, yeah. Okay, let me cut that up a little bit. So, uh oh, I'm not on fire. Um, it's Warriors of God. Well, we just finished playing both scenarios of actually. And uh, if you've been watching through it, you'll hear a lot of grousing about the historical aspects of it. Or maybe about the luck factors, and those are all real valid complaints. All that said, I still really like this game. In fact, just before today, uh, just before the, uh, the recent two plagues, I had this rated at a 9. Um, I've lowered that rating down to an 8 for two reasons. One is uh, the historical aspect of it, and the other has more to do with a gameplay aspect of it. So... One problem is that one might be tempted to think of this as a game, and it sure cannot be. Um, do they even talk about it as such? No, nah, you know, it's kind of it's a low-complexity game. They don't push it that way at all, and I think that's right, because it really does have the feel of these very broad stroke games that I like to call wimp games. And I, I've always clearly placed this in that realm. Um, the historical decisions that you're making don't feel like they're completely grounded on the same kind of thoughts. It's more a Euro-like in terms of, you know, wanting to control areas or a Martin Wallace type game or something. It's not the kind of game where you feel like you're going to learn a lot about history here. What do you do? Um, the few things that you kind of know and can plan for in the game uh, are things like leader arrival, which seem absolutely ridiculous. I mean, theoretically, you shouldn't know how good the next prince is going to be when he actually leads armies, or whatever. And um, that's, you know, one of the very, very few things in this game that you can plan from turn to turn, is how good am I going to be next turn? Can I play a delaying game for a turn because I know I'm getting, you know, Richard the Lionhearted next turn? Well, that seems pretty unreasonable. Usually, uh, like with Charles the Twelfth of Sweden, it's a shock when there's a great leader. There's no expectation that there's someone going to come and save the country. All right. Um, the actual historical likelihood that this game presents anything like the picture uh, that actually happened in either of these wars, well, series of wars in the first case, I would say, um, is almost... Nil. No. I mean, uh, there's nothing in the game to direct it in that way. And there's a lot of games that are kind of like this. I would say um, one that's quite a bit heavier that, that has that same kind of flavor is uh, Warriors China, uh, Warlords China in Disarray. Uh, very, still a light game, but has the same kind of feeling of you know, I've got so much freedom, and I'm just playing this game. Now, that one has a lot of diplomacy in it. Most of the types of games that are like this actually do. The one that comes closest to this, I think, uh, that I've played recently is... Um, I can't remember the name of it. Uh, it was the, Actually, I think it's another Starkweather game. He was involved in this, too. Uh, where uh, it's set in Japan, of course, and uh, most dangerous time. Uh, you know, that same kind of... We're setting the theme, we're kind of interested in all that, but this is not something that we're really going to try to capture the historical details of in the same way that you would expect in a war game, right? I mean... There can be simple war games. They usually don't take such a broad scope, though, when they are. They're usually just small battles, or, or, or maybe something like World War I by SPI, which is a fairly simple war game. Uh, 
this is not. This is a war-themed game, and there's no question there. But still, I like that. I mean, that a lot of my favorite games are in that realm. Um, I just, if you're looking for a serious war game and you don't believe that all games about war are war games, this is not what you'd be looking towards. Um, so, the other way to judge it is as a game. And here, it kind of falls short of, you know, these kind of empirical uh, objective standards that you could put on it. There's so much luck in it. It's really decided by how many times you succeed in losing the initiative. And yes, in the second scenario, you have some things you can do to help you lose the initiative. Of course, it feels counterintuitive. It feels like initiative should be the bonus, the way it's always described in the game, the fact that you have a bonus for keeping your king at home. But the truth of the matter is, losing the initiative means that you get a better setup for next turn. It does kill one of your actions, and that can be a big deal at certain times, but overall, uh, across the board, I would say losing the initiative is far more valuable than ever gaining it. So, uh, and on top of that, you're compelled to make attacks that are very, very risky one way or another. If they're regular battles, you're throwing a lot of dice, granted, the odds the, tend to even out a little bit the more dice you throw, but still some pretty big things can happen, especially with smaller battles over key locations. On the other hand, when you take a siege, it's almost entirely random. I mean, you know, if you're looking at, I've got a one or two in six chance of taking something versus fighting out a battle, it's really you know, hard to make that decision. Do I want to just let him maybe win something major on one roll of a die? Well, if he's already got the ground advantage for battle, yeah, you'll give him the risky siege. Uh, on the other hand, there are some sieges that are almost sure things, but the siege is kind of this, you know, um, uh, safety valve that you can throw in place to say, I would have no chance in this battle, but I've got a chance if I take it to a siege. Oh, or maybe I've got more than a chance, it's, it's guaranteed. So there are those kind of little decisions in there. A lot of, a lot of these little choices with a lot of luck on them, riding on them, that I still think makes it fun, even if I could see where some people would absolutely hate the amount of luck in this game. And, you know, honestly, both the scenarios that I played this time were in, almost entirely decided, on top of some mistakes that I made, but almost entirely decided really by uh, how many times did you lose the initiative. That is the single most important thing in the game from what I've seen. All right, so why do I like it? <laughs> and that's, you know, that's really hard. I had to kind of reach into my brain to find that. I've been in this situation with a few games, and I really, really liked this one when I first saw it. Um, I put it up there with Awful Green Things, actually. Uh, and, well, no. But uh, I thought that maybe there was a lot more skill in the game than there is. And there's a lot of skill in Awful Green Things, don't mistake that. Uh, well, other than the fact that it's imbalanced. But the... Uh, that, that was definitely one of the things that I looked at as I thought, okay, and I've played it against kind of weaker players only and really been able to dominate the game against them. But unlike Awful Green Things, unlike Korean War, I haven't been able to play it against people that I really consider a strong challenge in this type of game. So... And, and my experience really is that there's so much luck in it, as opposed to Awful Green Things, which I feel is actually unbalanced in favor of one side. Uh, I think that this one is actually pretty balanced. It's just, you better hope that, you know, the luck doesn't turn against you terribly much on those initiative die rolls, winning a lot of them. Uh, still, it gives this really nice flavor for the era in a way that maybe most war games can't. Um, 
And that's, that's one of the problems maybe I have with a lot of the uh, war games and why I'm attracted more to the WIMP games is that in a lot of the war games, the, especially the more detailed ones, you're focusing so much on the mechanics, etc., that you miss the big picture. And here the big picture is a war that was chaotic, uh, people changing sides left and right. This game is light enough to give you that feel. It has some pieces that show you that, hey, somebody got, you know, uh, routed or ransomed, and now they're on the other side. That's cool. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't capture all of the flavor of that. For example, turning sides in the midst of a battle, like what hap would happen in the War of the Roses, and I'm sure in some other areas as well. I'm just not familiar with them because the French and English conflicts outside, you know, they, this game contains two things. One, the big war, but also these uh, con uh, struggles within each of the countries. So, you know, you have the War of the Roses represented in here. You have Richard the Lionhearted's rebellion against his father represented here. Um, maybe in too strong a light, you know, the fact that he could just end up as a French leader and potentially the French king as opposed to being anything in England. Well, those feel a little funny to me, but still, you do have something of the flavor and it's a fairly light game. It's easy to play. It's very fast moving. I know it may not have seen that in the vids, but that's because it's harder for me to make my decisions while I'm looking at it. When you're actually playing it, it's just like boom, boom, boom. You move the things, and then you're on to rolling the dice for combat. Uh, you know, in the same way something like Axis and Allies or something moves quickly. So, there's still a big piece of me that really, really likes this game. Uh, in terms of that light, fluid war themed type of game but uh, it kind of fails where a lot of those games do succeed which is that there's not you know it's so if I set up something a, a very simple war game like uh, Africa Core there's sort of this stately progression but I can tell you a game that feels kind of like this that I did recently was 30 Years War um, with that same sort of kind of wandering around stuff happening. Although this is much, much more random and you have much less planning ahead, uh, even though in that game you don't have your cards, etc. beforehand. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, it's still a great deal of fun. It's just, I wouldn't expect to come out of it with a lot of historical insight, just a lot of flavor for the period. And, you know, that's the kind of thing that attracts me to something like uh, Empires of the Middle Ages, where you sit down and, you know, you know you're not playing a serious simulation of anything, but it's such a kick to play. And that's kind of how this is. It's such a kick to play. It's not a, it's not a game where you're going to defeat your enemy by being this grand strategist who's just more brilliant, I think. But it is an enjoyable, light little fear and pretzels type game. <laughs> All right.